My name is Ankit Kharik. I handle developer relations at 12 Labs. The title for this talk will be Implementing Video Understanding and Multimodal Video Search into your applications with a few API calls. All right, sounds heavy, but we are going to break it into bits and pieces. So at 12 Labs, we are tackling a really hard and awesome problem that would potentially make our lives way easier, way better than currently there then currently it is, or it might be. So this entire agenda of the talk that I'm currently giving is all about how 12 laps could make your life easier. Why video understanding? So coming back to the topic, video understanding. So when you hear the term video understanding, how, how many of you think of these things? You know, activity recognition, face detection, face recognition, image segmentation, some sort of like object detection or like sentiment analysis. So yeah, raise your, raise your hands. If, if this all comes to your mind, when I use the term video understanding. Okay, at least some. So, uh, so yeah, definitely you are on the right track. These are indeed some video understanding tasks because for active recognition, it's not just on the image level. You would have to consider multiple frames for the duration of the activity, and then somehow make sense of this temporal modality to be able to conclude the kind of activity that is happening within that scene, right? So it indeed is some sort of video understanding. So there is a point that I would come back to later, but for now, I just wanted to highlight that traditionally what, video under what, what, what sort of things come to people's mind when they face or encounter this term video understanding. So video understanding has evolved quite a lot over the years, 1878. This is where the video was actually invented. This is the starting of filmmaking. Actually, this reminds me of something cool. Yeah, let me hop on to that. I think that will be fasc fascinating to witness. Uh, so this is 12 laps playground. And there are, there are different indexes where I have uploaded a bunch of videos. So let's open this index that contains three videos, and I'm going to search across these three videos. My natural language keyword would be horse. And when I do that, a bunch of relevant segments from these videos just pop up. The images were taken for a scientific study into the gait analysis of a gallop horse. The participants so as you were can interested see, in whether the system semantically understands what its horse means and it displays all the relevant segments from the video that I've uploaded. So yeah, definitely feel free to watch this video titled A Brief History of Filmmaking. And that's where you would know like how there was this bet placed between a bunch of people. And the bet was about how at, at some point of time, while a horse is galloping, all the, fours, all the four grooves of the horse are in the air. So people were like, no way. Never at any point while the horse is running, there's an instance where all the four legs are up in the air. But actually, there is an instance, and that was proved by this bet, by, by, the, by the guy who actually set up something against this bet to prove that he was right. So what he did was he took 16 cameras, attached them to wireframes, and whenever the, hard would, the horse would pass these across these cameras, these wires would get tripped, and then... Uh, a snapshot would be taken. So 16 consecutive snapshots were taken, and that's how they realized that there's something exists called video. That was the very beginning of filmmaking. So I thought that that was something interesting. Like these kind of bets can turn into something really big down the line. Okay, so we know 19, 1878, the starting of filmmaking and the video. 1996, the first speech to text being commercialized. And now the most interesting one, 1997. You guys might remember Jan LeCun's experiment with uh, LeanNet5, handwritten digit recognition that he did with LeanNet5 architecture. So that was something really novel, and that paved the way for computer vision down the road. And now 2023, it's, it's the natural language uh, 
I mean, it, it's the LLM boom here. So we all know like how it goes now in 2023. But coming back to video understanding, earlier, if you would have to really try to figure out something that is happening in the video, the only option you had was just watch the damn entire video, right? Like just binge it until eternity and try to make sense of it. Then later down the road, when transcripts and some natural language processing techniques came up, then people started making sense of these videos using these awful transcripts that might be a little hard and uninteresting to read. And then further down the road, tags came into play. So now these videos will have some associated meta tags and you can probably do some sort of like, you know, video analytics task using these meta tags. But let's jump to something that is really interesting. And that is this ICCV challenge that was held in 2021. It was hosted by Microsoft. And this paper, uh, Viseret, it was ranked one in the video retrieval track. The value is capitalized entirely that word because that has a specific meaning in this context. So value stands for uh, the alignment between video and language. And what this, this ICCV conference does, it, it, it kind of evaluates these papers on how well they can map these modalities, which are vision and language. So that's the challenge here, like how you can map these modalities of vision and language together. So this is the high-level architecture uh, of Viseret that this more, uh, the high-level architecture that this paper kind of used for this challenge. And let me like quickly go over this because later down the road, when I show you the code, my notebook, and like we go, uh, we, we like, you know, run those APIs to, to do some interesting stuff, uh, you would be very, very comfortable understanding what's powering those APIs behind the scenes. So think of this video, a raw video that is comprised of different video frames. Now this transformer, this visual transformer, which is specialized transformer that takes an image data instead of the traditional text one. And what it does is uh, it on the frame level, it like pixel by pixel, patch by patch, try to analyze what's happening within that uh, segment of, of the image piece that, you, that you're giving it. So this is operating at the pixel, uh, at the frame level. And then on the other side, you have this subtitle encoder, which is another transformer that is operating on the text level for all the subtitles that you have corresponding to these video frames. And then finally, when this, the kind of uh, output a representation that is machine understandable, this representation is fed into another transformer that takes care of the temporal dimension or the time modality. So think of all these frames. So let, let's say the, uh, the video is 30 FPS. So you have like 30 frames per second. So within one second, you have 30 frames and you're trying to analyze temporally what's happening in these 30 frames. So in one minute, you're going to do the math and come up with how many frames there will be. So this second transformer up there, it's kind of like making sense of temporally how to make, how to, how to make sense of all these video frames that are sequentially coming one after another. Right, so that's what happening ha happens there, and there's something called uh, positional encoding that you might be aware of. What it does is, in transformer, your inputs are parallel, unlike those traditional RNNs and LSTMs, and because of that nature of transformer, uh, I mean it's scalable because of that. It's like so advanced because of that, but that's not the point. The point is, you need some sort of encoding to be able to make sense of the sequence because everything is getting inputted parallelly. So you need to be able to like make sense of what comes first, what comes next. So you do some positional encoding. And that's how you make sense of the sequence that is being in the sequence of frames or whatever data you're inputting to this transformer. So finally, this transformer, the temporal one, spits out something called video embedding. Simply put, it's video embedding. And these has sort of video vectors. Uh, and these video vectors for a downstream task, like maybe video search, which means like you want to search within your videos for something uh, that might be relevant to you. For example, there I search for horses, right? So it gives me those segments that correspond to that natural language query, which in this case was horse. So for that purpose, for such a downstream task, this video embedding will be mapped to the 
word vectors corresponding to the query that I'm giving the system. And then based on the similarity score between those two word vectors in the video embedding, you would get the most relevant segments, video segments out. So this is how, at a high level, this kind of a VLM, visual language model, works. This is like the construct of a visual language model. So we have seen LLMs, but this territory of visual language model is widely, like, like it's like a black art. It's widely, it's, it's very unexplored territory. So that's the excitement here. Like at 12 Labs, you're trying to explore this unknown territory and try to make sense of how it will, how it will be able to understand. So the caption is, corresponds to that video segment, and that's how you try to make sense of in an unsupervised or self-supervised manner, right? So uh -huh. we have seen how this technology stack corresponding to LL has evolved over time. But think of the corresponding evolution with respect to such a such a large language, such a large visual language model VLM, or you can, uh, or a multimodal foundation model. Like that's a fancy term that has come into existence recently with the rise of LLM. So a foundation model that is powering all these APIs like fine-tune APIs and rate API, search or classify API. And there are these, these video-centric applications that are gonna uh, consume uh, the output from these APIs. So this is the chat GPT arc, GPT-2, that was powered by the invention of the cool transformer that came in 2017. Then we have in 2020, the GPT-3, which really proved that these indeed are scalable models, which can actually generalize even when they are scaled up to that level. And then finally, 2022 end, we have ChatGPT, that is, and there's something called RLHF that makes it far more better than its, uh, than its existing counterparts. So the purpose of this is like, probably in the future, like 12 laps, with its video understanding platform is at this level, somewhere between GPT-2 and 3. But there will definitely be a Genkai Dama, like this large uh, spirit bomb kind of a movement uh, moment where, you know, everything will blow up and you would be able to see something crazy out there in the market, in the world. So for now, uh, coming back to the developer-centric nature of this, like we are, we've wrapped this multimodal foundation model in APIs. And these APIs will serve you in your, uh, to power your applications. So there might be different kind of surge APIs like video, to, like text to video, video to video, or classify API. We will dive later during the demo into all these things. So don't worry. Yeah, with this slide, I just wanted to make one point. When you saw these applications, like when you saw these video understanding tasks, there was a definitive objective behind training the model. And that was either to solve the problem of pose estimation or activity recognition or face recognition or whatever, or segmentation. But here, with this multimodal foundation model, the, the objective is very different. The objective is very, very general. And that objective is the way we humans see, hear, and understand the world and form internally like some sort of understanding or semantics corresponding to our to, to our perception of this world, the same way that is the objective behind these large multimodal foundation models. You know, like to be able to like understand the world and for formulate some sort of useful semantics that we could later down the road make sense of. Okay, so now the demo part. So you see this uh, interesting video. The search query corresponding to this video is Guy Drifting Red Mitsubishi. So it's from the, the famous movie Tokyo Drift, the Fast and the Furious series. And what I'm going to do is like, I'm going to index this uh, movie, the entire full length movie onto the platform. And then I will shoot up a language, natural language query like this. And then the system would be able to come up with the relevant video segments corresponding to my natural language query. And then um, finally, like, in order to, for the purpose of demo, what I'll do is like, I'll just spin up a simple demo app, which is flask based. And what I'll do is configure it so that we get a simple web page where the results will be embedded in the form of a video. So let's actually dive into that demo and play with some code. 
So this is the notebook that I've constructed. In the interest of time, I'm not going to you know, in, uh, execute every cell, but I'll do the most interesting parts. So what happens here is uh, I create an index. I store all my videos in that index, which in this case is the Tokyo Drift movie. And then um, finally, I shoot my search query. So here, as you can see, there's an AND operator. Uh, drift is the keyword. And I'm asking the system to visually search it. And for Mitsubishi, I'm asking it to look into the logo part of the video, like OCR kind of stuff. And then I'm combining these two things and asking the system to look for scenes where there's drift, drift happening. And you see the logo along with that uh, drift sequence. So let's... Let's just run this cell. Yeah. So what I just did was run the this code piece, which just, you know, uh, it just spins up the Flask app and, and you know, uh, so the API gives you these timestamps, like the start and end timestamp corresponding to your natural language query that you put for the video that you indexed and the video that you indexed. And that start and end I have used along with the local video, the Tokyo Drift movie on my local hard drive. So I used that movie from my local hard drive. And then I use these timestamps from this API. And together, I asked, I configured this Flask uh, app to pull up these two things and then render a gorgeous looking web page like this with this kind of a video. So if I play this, you would see the same sequence here. You see the red with Tsubushi and drift is happening in the scene. And you see that logo in there. If you closely uh, pay attention, then you would see like there, there are parts in the video that comprise of the logo of Mitsubishi. Like here, there's this Mitsubishi logo. Okay, so if you want to know more, like you can read my tutorial. So I have a full flesh tutorial here that explains in detail what is happening uh, and what each individual code piece is actually doing. So with this, so having said all this, what does the future of video AI looks like? I mean, we have seen transform. We have we have seen how scalable these. VLMs are. Uh, we have seen uh, uh, how this power law applies to this VLM, and and that that's what gives us hope. Hope that with the right kind of clean data sets that are comprised of these uh, visual text pairs, we would be able to train really large multimodal foundation models with the objective that I just mentioned, and really make. And, and really create that semantical understanding of the world, which could be used to power the downstream applications like video search or classifying video content. So I'm fairly excited for this kind of a future. One more thing that I would like to highlight is the challenge with the video. So for the text, if you compare it with just a corresponding one second of video for just one sentence text comprised of basically 20 words, you would find that it's 276, 7, 276 thousand times larger than this than the, that that one sentence piece just for that one second of video. So it's a computationally very intense uh, uh, problem. So yeah, um, definitely, I would encourage you to jam with fellow multimodal minds on our Discord. This is the QR code. You can scan it and jump in right away. If you want to connect with me, these are my credentials on the right bottom. And I'm happy to chat right after the talks. API gives you all the metadata that you need in order to like, uh, you know, incorporate uh, this kind of video search into your applications. So as you, as you saw, like the API gave you information like the starting timestamp, the ending, thumbnail, so it gives you a bunch of uh, metadata corresponding to the kind of API it is. In case of search, it was start and end and timestamps. 
So what you could do is like, you could utilize that metadata to power your application right away. So the API is constructed in a manner that's easily integratable and extensible. So it does not, it would not take you days to do that. You can right away in like, so in this entire notebook, I just made three API calls. So right away in just three API calls, you were able to get the kind of results that you saw, right? The indexing processes take some time because it happens on the platform. So it's not like, uh, it's not, ha so we are gonna go on-prem, like we, we will have on-prem pretty soon. So that way you would be able to, you know, on your premise, uh, run these models and get the output. But for now, uh, the 12 Labs platform powers uh, these APIs and all the training and inference happens using on the platform.